Lack of knowledge is rarely the reason we get stuck. It's not from lack of knowing, it's from lack of doing. And my goal is to try to give people you know, strategies on how they can close that gap between what they know and what they do. This is Entrepreneurs The Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is The Playbook. This is Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing, here with Entrepreneur The Playbook. And I am with a guy who has traveled old school, that's why I love him, here to New York City to see me, Alan Stein, performance coach yes, extraordinaire. Sir. Took the bus, baby. That's, you know what, I'm still on the bus. I saw a uh, Gary Vee Instagram post about like, if you think entrepreneurs are all about bottle service and private jets, and he's lying down, he goes, try 15 hours of straight meetings sleeping in the airport so I can take a red eye for 15 hours or more meetings tomorrow. Absolutely. I think both of you feel that we feel that way right oh, now, right? Yeah, it, it is awesome. And you know, this is for entrepreneur and I'd like to mix up the sports side because okay. everyone sees sports as so much fun and passion and all that, but it's a business. And uh, you know, I want to get to the point where everybody wants to know how do I get a job in sports doing what I love to do. And that's really what they're asking. Absolutely. How do I get a job doing what I love to do. You love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. Absolutely. How did you get to do what you love to do? Well, thankfully I was given that advice very early, which is find what you love and find what you're good at and then find where those two things intersect. And that's kind of the sweet spot where you wanna live. And for me, it had always been basketball. Uh, and still to this day is one of the strongest passions I have. Uh, so to be able to make my living as a basketball performance coach was amazing. You know, young, when I was younger in my career, it was more about, can I get players faster and stronger? As I got older, I saw myself more as a role model and a mentor, and can I actually teach them leadership and, and habits and accountability, so things bigger than the game. But that's why the game's been so good to me. It's, it's been a platform for me to, to teach life lessons, which I think is more important. And when did you transition from player to coach? So I played at, it was Elon College at the time down in North Carolina, so yep. I graduated in 1998, and uh, being a basketball performance coach up until 18 months ago is all I've ever done. And then about 18 months ago, I made the leap over to the corporate side to start sharing these same messages with businesses on how they can improve their performance. But, you know, to think that I made most of my living wearing gym shorts and sneakers, working with kids in the game that I love, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful. Yeah, and that's part of what you teach, I'm sure, gratitude. Absolutely. Tell me some more of the transition values that allows you to lead in the corporate world now the way you led on the court. What are some of those values that people should look at? Well, the most important one I actually learned from watching Kobe Bryant work out back in 2007. And ultimately what he taught me is the best never get bored with the basics. That you can't skip over the basics. I gotta repeat chase. that, hold on. Yeah. I love that Dave Meltzer stealing a line from Alan Stein right here. The best never get bored of the basics. I stole it from Kobe, so you're I good love hands. it, that's good, yeah. yeah. And I watched a private workout of his where he was doing basic footwork and offensive moves. Now, I mean, it's Kobe, so he's doing it you know, at an unparalleled level of effort, and he's doing it with precision, but the stuff he was doing was so basic. And I was blown away, because as a young coach, I figured someone who at that time in 2007 was arguably the best player in the world, I figured I was gonna see some real hot sizzle, some sexiness, and yeah. that was the basics done over and over. And I think that's the first lesson that I try to teach players is you got to fall in love with the basics. And, and that's not easy to do. Because yeah. as you know, the basics are often, they're boring and they're mundane, but they're critical to success. I, I love that because my success is based on something that's very basic and mundane and it's my calendar. Yes. Right? I am a student of my, well, I teach people to be a student. I'll tell you, I'm a doctor of my calendar. I love it. Right, I, PhD. PhD, because that calendar to me raises the awareness, the vibration of what I do. Yes. What basics do you start in the corporate world? Because obviously in the corporate world, we don't really necessarily care about our footwork. Right, so to me, it's finding that analogy. So if footwork is to basketball as X is to say leadership, and what I found, it's something you're, a, you also have a PhD in, it's hmm. active listening. It's the ability to listen to others. Not, not just waiting for your turn to talk, but listening because you're truly trying to connect. And, I, and the best leaders and coaches I've been around, they listen. They have a pulse on their players. They have a pulse on their employees, and they listen. They listen to their customers. They listen to their clients. They listen to their, their colleagues. And, and I think that's the footwork of, of leadership. 
I agree. I, I do want to let you steal another line from me now. Please, I would love I mean, to. But this one, it's amazing because, you know, as you get older, because you're, you're in this game, it'll be you're 50 years old and you're like, gosh, someone will you know, DM me, that's genius. And I'm like, I don't say that enough. Right? I forget that some of these basics, right? So that active listening for me was told by my older brother when I told him I you know, hated hospitals. He said, be more interested oh, yes. than interesting. That's and active that's the listening. definition of active listening. It's yeah. another way to frame it. It kills it. And people and love that. that. You should, please. I and love you that. don't have to give me credit. Give my older brother credit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and what I find with all these things, and this is the other reason I, I've been so attracted to the content you put out, is it's what I call a performance gap. It's the gap between what we know and what we do. And we all have these gaps. You know, this this whole concept of, of the calendar, I think it's something most people know. It's something most people don't do. And that's the problem. So lack of knowledge is rarely the reason we get stuck. It's not from lack of knowing, it's from lack of doing. And my goal is to try to give people, you know, strategies on how they can close that gap between what they know and what they do. Because most of us know a lot more than we think, but we don't put it into action. And then we wonder why we don't get the result we want. And I think it, not only, you know, you talk about PhDs or non-PhDs, experts and neophytes, but for me, I think it's important because you're, you're nailing a really important part. It's where hypocrisy comes from. It's where a lack of perspective comes from. It's why I talk about I am in an enjoyment because I have a passion yep. for the consistent every day. And when you talked about meditating, I love the fact because I know you're a consistent guy yes. because you said I'm 300 and whatever days. 378 today. 378. Today. Right. And, and, and most people don't know it's so hard just to be consistent, but persistent without quit enjoying the pursuit of my potential. The potential is the actual doing all the time. Yes. And the knowing is is that first part. Yes. And there's a gap there at all times. Absolutely. And and that includes, you know, I you meditate and I meditate. Yes. Um, and I meditate to find my baseline in life. Because I want to go back to center. I'm you know, especially this week, there's some personal things going on, issues that aren't going on. Yep. There's and I'm under a tremendous amount of Sorry, I'm going to choke it up over it. Yeah. But I just got to go back to center, right? Go back to center, sit there. Because the old Dave, that gap would get really big yeah. because you, and you see it on the basketball court. Yeah. Guys get in their own way, train. right? It's running from you and you can't Yeah, and when you, you have, control it. it's easy to pretend in the corporate world, but you can't pretend on a court. Right. right? That's why guys go 0 for 5. Or that's why pitchers pitch two innings. Or that's why basketball players like Steph Curry can have a game where he bangs two shots, right? right? It's it's not the skill, no. right? It's literally he's not in center, yes. Because he, he has he's worked so hard, he's put in the work, yes. and there's this this gap here. How do you, as a coach, get somebody to have that same passion, to have passion and enjoyment about the basics like their calendar? You know, it, I mean, to take a, a page out of Simon Sinek's book, it's back to the why. You've got to figure out the why. And I think sometimes in business, we can easily get derailed or get lost and we start chasing somebody else's why, or we start pouring into what we think should be important for our business. And it's not why we started it in the first place, or it's not why I started working here in the first place. And it, it goes back to what you just said, get back to center, get back and find that why, what it is that used to get you excited in the morning. And, and when you can get back to that, but it takes clarity. And that's why that concept of, of getting back to center is crucial. It's interesting you say that because a lot of people use vision boards. Do you, you use a vision yeah, board? Yeah, absolutely. And, in it, and because we have different mediums, it's not just like John Asseroff talked in The Secret. You know, it's not a poster on your wall, right? No. People have them all over. But the idea of why was so important for me to help my clients advance because a lot of times they were attaching to an outcome mm -hmm. with no purpose. Yeah. And I believe the next step of why is to infuse purpose into things that you may have the wrong purpose to attach to. And let me give you a quick example, Please. and I'd like you to give me how you use this, because I bet you do, is that I find you know, if, if you don't like taking out the trash, it's because you, you don't have the right purpose in it. So like for me, I didn't like taking out the trash, I changed the purpose of taking out the trash. Yeah. Instead of the purpose was to make my wife happy, it then for me became, I needed more time to think about what I want to be happy for me. And when, the minute I changed the purpose, I started taking out trash all over, and pretty soon the energy of my energy made all of a sudden my wife want to take out the trash and my daughters want to take out the trash. 
I think it works in the corporate world. Do you have any examples where you've been in this leadership, uh, you know, consultation, and the they don't insert the right purpose in it. They, they've lost that why, but also beyond the why they do it, they haven't inserted the purpose in behind it. Yeah, and, and purpose is everything. And, it, and it's important to admit, especially when you're part of something bigger than yourself and you're with a team, that, that your purpose for playing a certain role may be different than the way that I view it. And I, I have to have that respect and compassion and empathy things I know you talk about in order for, you and I may have different purposes for taking out the trash, and that's okay but we have to connect it to ourselves so that it's meaningful work that we're doing and we feel like we're, we're delivering something you know, to, the, to the greater mission and we're doing it within our role. You know, I'm such a big guy on, on, on roles within an organization or a team and star in your role, whatever that role may be, we need you to star in it because we can't win without you, but you can't win without us. And it's that inverse relationship that's, that's crucial to making an organization and we have to respect everybody's role. My, my role may be bigger than yours from a proverbial standpoint, but yours is just as important to the success of the rest of us. And again, that all goes back to being tied to some purpose. Because you can't star in your role if you don't find purpose in your role and you don't find meaning in what it is that you're doing. Yeah, one of the best people I've ever met with that is Reggie Love, who's oh, you know a friend yes. there in DC. I'm, I'm a big Duke fan, so yes, I love that episode. Isn't that ama amazing? Because like, it wasn't until I like you start putting people into different roles, but you're like, wait a second, this guy, like. He was the role player for Duke, yes. right? National champion. He's a role player for President Obama. Yeah, you know, <laughs> two pretty good teams. Yeah, and then now <laughs> you know he's in a different role in the financial side of things, and he's monetizing that. Um, when you, when you're in a certain role, is there a balance as a leader between wanting a bigger role and playing the supporting part? How how do you balance that? Because I find when I coach, it's a difficult thing to help people understand that. You can still have an expansive view of yourself of course, and you still should. play the role yes. that you're in today. So the, the terminology I would use is star in your role while you work extra times during the unseen hours to expand your role. So right now we need you to do what we need you to do to add to this team. But then during the unseen hours when nobody's watching, the cheerleaders aren't dancing, the cameras are off, then you put in the extra hours to prove that you deserve an expanded role. You know, perfect example is a, a high school basketball player that thinks he should be a three-point shooter. It's not a very proficient three-point shooter. Well, if you'd like to be a three-point shooter on this team, then you better be coming in early and staying late to put in the work to show me that you deserve to take threes when it matters. And it's the same translation to anybody in the corporate world. Absolutely. Now, one of the other uh, areas that I find that most people don't look at is they wonder, how do you get to be where you're at? And meaning that, Look, you and I weren't superstars no. in performance, no. Far from it. but people pay us a ton of money, look up to us now, and we're able to somehow connect in that way. How are you able to communicate your value with confidence when you're selling yourself that you know what the heck you're talking about? Because you didn't do it yourself. No. You're not Kobe Bryant. Definitely not. I mean, not. you did it at a certain level, but you're not Kobe Bryant. I think it, it comes back to self-belief and confidence, and that only comes through demonstrated performance. That can never come up from something that you just kind of try to make up out of thin air. You've got to put in the work to deserve it, and, and then it's all about establishing trust. It's about making sure that you believe that what I'm going to share with you is going to add value to your life and you're going to get better. I would expect that the players that I used to train could run faster and jump higher than me. I mean, if they couldn't, they're not going to be very good players. Right. So it wasn't a matter of that, but another thing that I think helps improve credibility and trust is I've never asked anyone to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. Even the players. I might not jump as high or be able to do as many pull-ups, but I'm willing to do anything that I'll ask them to do and I think that's incredibly important. And then once you've built that trust, you know people are willing to run through fire for you. Yeah, and I you know, we talked about vulnerability before the show yes. and you know Which I is a sign of strength, by the way. I, I think a lot of people get that they get that backwards. You know, I, I, here's how I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but here's how I look at vulnerability. Yeah. It's like you and I going into a sword fight and you're not wearing any armor. Like, that means you're, you're tough. If you're willing to fight me and I've got a sword and you're not wearing any armor, that's the definition of strength and toughness. It's not the opposite. And, and you know, I have, I have twin sons that are eight years old and a six-year-old awesome. daughter. But really what's important to me, especially with my boys, is, is teaching them that being vulnerable is a masculine trait. And it's, it's the key to connection with anyone. I'm glad you said that because that's where I was getting to. Is like I pride myself for you know the last ten years of my life 
being true to myself. Yeah. And so that means drop the armor, right? I try to be as truthful as I can about my successes, yep. right? I don't oversell them and my failures, I don't hide them, yes. right? I just, this is what it is and why it is. Um, but I've learned that because of that, I instantly, like when you came in, I have this emotional connection with people. Yes, you do. Because the armor's gone, so all that you can connect to me with is this guy. Like, you know, I got choked up because, I, yeah. you know, my poor father-in-law is passing away, and we, we got into that. And I'm not afraid to, to, to say it, but it, it, it hurts, right? But I could feel, oh, but that's what there's drew, like this that's breath, what like drew me years here. Of, years, of, years of relationship yeah. just was occurred because we bonded. Yes, and, but, but we've never met. Right. I took a four-hour bus ride to get here just to have this 15-minute conversation because that's the energy that you put out in the podcast world, I've devoured your podcast, and, and that's to me something really special. But but think about that, the, the credibility and the connection that we've been able to establish. Shoot, I've known you for 20 minutes and I'd run through fire for you right okay. now. Okay. To me, that's the key to coaching. Coaching is, I heard when I, w I was very thankful when I was a young coach that I learned the process is you connect first, you coach second. Has to be in that order. Anytime you try to flip it, if I try to coach you before we've created a connection and before there's trust and before I've actively listened to what it is that you want to get out of this, you'll never give me your best effort and you'll never give me the focus and the discipline required to be great. So it's all about building that connection. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been fairly successful in the performance world is because I've, I've been able to establish those connections. Um, and that had to come with maturity because you know when you're younger is all about you. When yeah. you get older, you realize, boy, it ain't about me, it's about you. And once, once I was able to switch that light switch, my whole world opened up and everything I was doing with players and now in the business world has changed. Yeah, it seems like you listen actively, you're vulnerable. Is there anything else you do? Because I think it's so important for people to understand that everyone has certain levels of skills, knowledge, and passion. But if you can't connect on an emotional level through active, I call it being more interested than interesting, yes, through being vulnerable, is there some other way, like in the corporate world, it's, like I said, much easier on the court because it's an emotional place, yes. right? Like there's much more momentum in a game and in practice than in the corporate world. Yes. How do you create momentum or, or that connection in the corporate world beyond just you know, active listening yep. and being vulnerable? Is there any other things you would give as advice to, to young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general? I think there's a couple words that, that I always had a negative connotation with. And now that I'm older, and especially in the corporate world, I've actually tried to flip. One is confrontation and one is accountability. Um, I, I think I stole this out of Coach K's book, but, but confrontation is just facing the truth head on. If I'm willing to confront you about an issue, it's because I care about you. It's not for any other reason. And once both people acknowledge that, then you've got something special. And, and same thing for accountability. You know, holding, something, holding someone accountable is something you do for them. It's not something you do to them. And that's, you know, if, if I'm not living up to the standards of our team and you call me on it, that's because you care about me and you care about the team. You're protecting the locker room. And that's incredibly important. But lots of times we think, well, why does Dave keep getting on me? You know, I used to have to tell players all the time, the reason Coach Jones gets on you is because he loves you. Maybe it's because he cares about you. Stop, you start to worry the day he stops getting yeah, on I you. I say that in my business and all the time. And it's, there's so much truth to that. So I think getting people to understand that healthy confrontation after you've built trust and holding each other accountable to the standards that you've collectively created are, are vital and that you do that from a place of love and trust. And yeah, we're gonna disagree on things. We may even have some heated exchanges, but when we go back to the baseline, the baseline is always, I've got your back, you've got mine, and we're here to protect this organization. So we may be angry at each other for an evening, and that's okay. We wake up the next day and go, you know what, he did that because he cares about me. And caring is a choice. So you, if you have an organization of 100 people, the chance that you like every one of them probably not so high. And that's okay, because as you talk about all the time, we have different vibrations and energies. You just click with some people better than others. But you choose whether or not you care about someone. And I might not want you to be my BFF, but I can still choose to care about you. And when you get an organization that makes the choice for everyone to care about each other, and care about their roles, and care about their commitment to the team and the organization as a whole, then you have something really special. And it's a choice. All of these things are a choice. And where does forgiveness fall in? Uh, well, it always starts with yourself. You got to forgive yourself. I mean, and that's sometimes the hardest thing to do because most of the entrepreneurs I've met are so driven and so ambitious and they want to take on the world and they're their biggest critics to themselves. You got to have some compassion for yourself in order to be able to truly do that for other people. So forgiveness, and that's one that's also in my own personal life, has come with age and maturity. I could hold some grudges back in my 
my previous life and now I realize what's the point? It's only stressing me out and getting me angry. Yeah, I mean, you know, we let other people take our joy so many different times in our lives and we waste so much energies on the highs and lows. Last question. Sure. What legacy do you want to leave, Alan? Ah, oh, man, that's a powerful one. You know, uh, my first inclination is it's always with my children. It's, you know, if in this case I have three children, if I can raise three children that grow up and can contribute to this world and, and are good people that live happy, fulfilling lives, you know, I, I always say in basketball, we say guard your yard. From a, as a defensive player, you got to guard it. So first, I want to take care of my own backyard and make sure that my kids grow up to be happy, well-adjusted contributors to society. And then anything outside of that, if that if there's an offshoot and there's any way that I've added energy to your life or to somebody else's life, I feel good about that. I want to be known as an energy giver. Yeah, right on. Well, I think we'll call it guard your yard, but make it bi as big as a yard as you can. I love right? it. Right? Start with your backyard and make it bigger. Well, anyway. Thanks, man. This will be many, you, man. many different meetings that we're going to have. Awesome. This is the first, and uh, for sure, it'll just keep growing because I'm so amazed. And I will tell you, so grateful that you went all this way. It's such an honor and a compliment. Like, I'm doing the right things. When people like you will drive that far there and back in one day just to spend these 20 minutes with us, I can tell you that you made my day. It's been a difficult day for me. Of course. But thank you. Well, keep doing it because you, I mean, you had a profound impact on me and we've never met, and I'm not alone in that. So thank you for the opportunity. Oh, you're awesome, man. Well, this is Alan Stein with Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneur The Playbook.